for first interview at the Ethereum DevCon, uh, I am interviewing Piper Merriam, who has a very interesting project called the Ethereum Alarm Clock to do scheduled function calls. Before we go into the Ethereum Alarm Clock, perhaps Piper, you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm from Boulder, Colorado. I've been a web developer for five or six years now, and um, always interested in crypto stuff. When Bitcoin came around, it was fascinating. and. When Ethereum came around, I sort of bit a lot harder and started into it. So, 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 so what, what problem does Ethereum alarm clock intend to solve? Um, there's no way for contracts on Ethereum to uh, wake up on their own. Um, any c uh, execution of contract function calls has to be executed by uh, some entity outside of the network. Um, so for contracts to truly be autonomous, um, there are things like scheduled payments are a really good example where a, a contract needs to execute something at a later time. Um, and what the Ethereum alarm clock does is set up a marketplace where contracts can pay somebody to trigger their execution at a time specified in the future. So for instance, let's take an example. Um, Let's take the example of me wanting to make monthly payments for my rent in, in Ether. So the 28th of every month, I want to make a monthly payment. And before the start of the year, I want to put 12 months worth of rent into a contract and then have the contract pay out each month to my to my landlady. That, that kind of thing would be uh, viable for the Ethereum clock, right? Absolutely. Um, right now, there's no support for recurring calls, but it's very much a thing that's planned. Um, but even right now, you could still do that. Um, you would deploy a wallet. Um, that wallet, you would configure it so that it would accept function calls from the Ethereum alarm clock address. Um, and essentially, at the time of deployment, you could schedule all 12 of those payments as an initializing action, or you could deploy it and schedule them yourself. Um, and essentially, you provide all of that gas money up front, you put enough money in the wallet, and, um, and on, at, at those times, somebody, hopefully, uh, picks up that, that call, uh, initi initiates it for you and gets whatever payment you've uh, set aside for them. Okay. So in, in a sense, like the Ethereum alarm clock is a basic infrastructure that future financial applications would need in order to trigger, trigger actions on the Ethereum blockchain at certain predefined times. Yeah, um, it's, it's something that I've thought about a lot that I... Um, I want it to be a base level piece of infrastructure, and because of that, I've tried to build it in a fashion where I don't own it. Um, I want it to be something that's very publicly owned, um, that people can get behind and use without feeling like there's some corporate interest at involved or things like that. So uh, all of the design of all of the contracts involved, there's no special access for me. And the deployment that I put out today removes all of the compulsory payments going to me. So starting today, you can do scheduled calls that don't pay me anything, and that's fine. That's your choice. Um, so I want it to be something that people are comfortable getting behind as a as a foundational service uh, for contracts. So let's let's walk through how um, how the clock would work. So suppose I, I make a, a scheduled call to pay my to pay my monthly rent to my landlady. Now who uh, which contract do I interact with and who is actually actually making the um, when the when the time comes which person is actually putting the transaction that pays the money to my landlady. Cool. Uh, so if you set up a transaction uh, scheduled call t today, then I will be the person who ends up executing that call. Um, the alarm clock is set up so that anybody may do that. But as of right now, it's a very new service. And I've, nobody else has turned on a server to do it. It's not surprising. It's a very new thing. Um, so essentially, you or the contract, it doesn't matter, can set up that scheduled call. Uh, essentially, you, pro you provide the alarm clock service with the, without getting into too much detail, with the information it needs to call your function. 
Um, it deploys a standalone contract that you basically own. You're able to kill it at any time you want and get all your money back, things like that. Um, and that contract sits there um, waiting to be called. Uh, I have a service running that is monitoring for upcoming scheduled calls, and when the time comes, when the block comes that you want that call to be executed, it will pick it up, uh, ping the service. All of that data that you gave it that represents the function call uh, is, is executed against your uh, contract, and I get my fee, my payment that you set aside for me, and all of the extra gas money that wasn't, I get all the gas money that, that uh, the gas expenditure for ex executing that is paid back to me, and then all the rest of the money goes right back to you immediately. So, okay. so is the plan in the future to have, uh, so essentially what you're saying is right now the person actually executing a scheduled call is centralized, that is you, but uh, do you plan to make it decentralized in some fashion in the future? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so the only reason that it's centralized is because there is only one node in a distributed system. So there is no centralization in the sense that my server that's executing transactions is special. It's just that I'm the only one doing it. Oh. So anybody may turn, may execute transactions. Anybody may make money by executing other people's function calls. I'm just waiting for the second person to step in and do it. And the reason that it's probably not happening is because there's no documentation on how to run that. And that's something that I'm just one guy, and I am working my way through the things that I know need to be done for the service, and that one's somewhere soon, but I haven't gotten into it yet. So, so the way it would work is um, if, um, if I, I schedule a function call with your service, and then let's say instead of one person making actually the calls, there are 100 people in the world that are interested in this line of yep. business. So let's call them X1 until X, X100. So there are 100 people or 100 nodes, let's say, that want, that want to do this. Then um, how does the system select which one of these nodes will actually get to make the call? And how does it ensure that one of them will make the call? Um, so there is no assurance that somebody will make the call. and. As much as I don't like having to say that, it is a fact. Um, there is no way to guarantee that somebody will call your function. And there's also, as a network level thing, there's no way to guarantee that a transaction will be included in a, in a specific block. Um, but the thing that Alarm Clock does is it set up, sets up a real guaranteed financial incentive for people who are willing to, to sit on the other side of the service to execute them for you. Um, I've been talking to a couple of the other app developers, um, uh, some people at Consensus, and essentially there's a number of apps that are being set up right now where each, um, where the company itself is setting up their own version of this for their app. Um, I know that um, uh, Oracleize it has something like this sitting behind their application that does that picks up things that need to happen, executes them, and then returns the value at a specific time. Um, Oracleize it probably has a number of servers pointed at that, and so they have a couple of servers, and those calls are as reliable as those servers. If Oracleize it chose instead to use alarm clock then they would have that same level of reliability of their servers plus one, because I have a server running too. And so as more people pile on and choose to use Alarm as their infrastructure rather than building their own infrastructure, then now the third person to pile on has all of the reliability added by Oracleize it and myself and theirs and Oracleize it now has even more reliability because now that there's a third. So there's this sort of snowball effect that um, hoping will happen. Okay, so, so what you're saying is essentially once there are like say thousands of people who are in the business of executing calls for other people, mm -hmm. then we can be pretty sure that at least one of them will, will execute it on time. At the point where there's at least five or six, at that point the reliability is going to be extremely high, um, absent large scale problems like like client issues or things like that. At the point where there's where there's you know five or six people servers out there, 
you essentially need a failure of all of those servers at the time that your call is supposed to be scheduled for your call to not be scheduled, uh, executed. And there's also a lot of um, strong guarantees built into the service that um, no entity is capable of censoring your contract. It's not possible for somebody to, to, to make sure that your call doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of strong guarantees that I'm trying to offer, um, and and I. Anyways, there, there's a lot of strong guarantees around. You will get paid for executing calls, and and from the scheduler side, that while I can't guarantee that it will get called, I can guarantee that there won't be any manipulation of the call. So. So, so let's say let, let's say now I want to go and open a scheduler's business, which means I want to become a person who executes other people's calls and earns money every time I execute, and that's my. That I want to be. I want that to be my living. So, what kind of infrastructure and what kind of uh, capabilities do I need on my end to become one? You could run it on your home computer, but you need something that's going to be online all the time. If you want to do something. Um, the the over, the the need of the machine that's running a, an an executing service is very low. I'm running mine on an Amazon EC2 instance. It's the smallest instance type available, and it runs just fine. It has a geth node installed and running on it, and a Python script that's managed by supervisor. Uh, that Python script is open source. It's in the main repository for al uh, Alarm Clock, which is also open source. Um, and while there's no documentation on how to run it, it is absolutely something that somebody could take today, install on a server, turn it on, and start theoretically making money executing people's calls. What kind of apps have actually used your infrastructure or, or, or are in the process of building some? Uh, I know of two. <laughs> uh, one of them is my own, uh, which is essentially just something that I put out there each time I deploy a new version, uh, verifying that the service is up and running and working as expected. Um, and there's one that was posted on Reddit uh, last week or the week before, which essentially is uh, it's a guy who wanted to see what it looked like to tie three different services together. So it uses EtherDice, it gambles, and in the event that it, and then it schedules a transfer to happen later. And at that time, alarm clock calls the service. And if there's money in the service, because it won, because of EtherDice, uh, then that money is sent through a Bitcoin relay to a Bitcoin address. Wow, that's a, that's a really cool idea, isn't it? It was super cool. I, was, I came home and was really excited to see that they had done it. So basically, they what they made was a, a gambling contract where somebody could just put money in the gambling contract. If he wins, he gets that those funds in Bitcoin. And uh, the way it works is it, it uses Ethereum alarm clock to trigger the transfer to a Bitcoin address. Yep. Yeah, so... Uh, Essentially, when that alarm clock call comes in, if the if he got lucky on EtherDice, then it takes that Ether and transfers it out of the network and into a, uh, through a Bitcoin relay. Cool. So how can how can the viewers uh, find out more about Ethereum alarm clock? I try to focus really heavily on good documentation, um, making it easy for people to pick it up and use it. Um, there, it's Ethereum dash alarm. I just forgot my URL. Anyways, you can Google it. It's going to be the first thing that shows up. Ethereum alarm clock. It's better than me rambling off a URL anyways. Um, the, there's clear links to the documentation. Um, if you look in the actual GitHub repository, there's lots of example contracts in my tests, um, example implementations of things that, that use alarm. Um, and... Uh, there is, an, as well as good example Im implementations, it's something that you don't have to trust. There's very thorough instructions on the main website for how to verify the source code of Alarm Clock. So, Thanks a lot, Piper, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.